The following statement appears in the Talmud. Rav Avira said, because of the merit of the righteous women that were in that generation, the Israelites were redeemed from Egypt. This is a curious statement. After all, the number one hero who we usually think of when we think of the Exodus is Moses. So who was Rav Avira referring to? Well, the Talmud goes on to explain and to offer a litany of stories about different women who feature in the Exodus narrative. For those of us who are aware of the biblical story, perhaps the most prominent female heroes are the so-called Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, who quietly defy Pharaoh's order to kill the Israelite baby boys upon birth, thus ensuring the continuation of the Jewish people. When Pharaoh realizes that they have been disobeying him, they find an excuse that he believes thus ensuring their safety and their own ability to continue bringing Israelite babies into the world. The rabbis in the Talmud elaborate upon their actions, praising their bravery and speculating on who they were and on their characteristics. Miriam too is understood by the rabbis to be one of the righteous women of her generation whose merit led to the exodus from Egypt Interestingly enough, in the rabbinic imagination, her heroism also manifests in standing up for the right of the Israelites to reproduce. The Talmud teaches that when Miriam's father Amram saw that Pharaoh had decreed that all Israelite boys were to be killed, he divorced his wife and all other Israelite men followed his example. He couldn't bear to have a son who would be killed. So he chose to have no children at all. Miriam, however, reproached her father. Father, your decree is harsher than Pharaoh's. As Pharaoh decreed only with regard to the males, but you decreed on both the males and the females. Upon hearing his daughter's words, Amram remarried his wife, Yocheved, and as a result, she became pregnant with Moses soon after. So in the eyes of the rabbis of the Talmud, the heroines of the Exodus were champions of the right to reproduce in the face of adversity. In our country, we also have a history of restricting the rights of certain populations to reproduce even to the extent of sterilizing women with intellectual disabilities without their knowledge or their consent. However, when we talk about reproductive rights in this country, our minds often go not to the right to have children, but to the right not to have children, as well as the right and the access to terminate a pregnancy for any number of reasons. Well, there has long been a robust conversation about all of these issues within the Jewish tradition, that discussion tends to use very different frameworks than those generally used in contemporary American society. Several months ago, the National Council on Jewish Women announced the first annual Repro Shabbat, a day to teach about and explore Jewish approaches to reproductive rights. They asked rabbis around the country to take a day to teach about this important topic. So at Temple Amuna, we have designated today as Repro Shabbat, as we prepare to welcome in a holiday whose story celebrates the actions of women who put their lives on the line to protect at least a certain type of reproductive rights of the Jewish people. I recognize that even bringing up this topic has the potential to raise a lot of emotions. I'm certain that of us here today, some of us, and certainly our family members and friends, have struggled with infertility, have experienced miscarriages, and have even had stillbirths. Some of us and our loved ones have had abortions for unwanted pregnancies and for wanted ones where something went wrong. And as many as you know, as many of you know, 
I myself am expecting a baby and am anticipating its arrival which mu with much gratitude and excitement. And I'm also aware of the tenuousness of this moment and of the great fortune that I have had to be healthy and that my future child appears to be healthy and also that I have had the ability to make choices about my own health care that have helped me to reach this moment. In American society, we often hear about reproductive rights, the reproductive rights debate as being a debate between choice and life. But in the Jewish tradition, the conversation tends to be about life versus potential life balancing the impact of the decision on the life of a parent against the potential life that might be. It's very rare to have uniformity of beliefs within Judaism, but there is probably the closest you might get to a consensus, not complete, but close, among traditional sources that full personhood begins at birth, not at conception. The text which forms the basis of traditional Jewish thinking on this topic is from Exodus chapter 21. In verse 12 of that chapter, we are told that a person who fatally strikes another person should be put to death. And just 10 verses later, we hear a different scenario. Should men brawl and collide with a pregnant woman and a miscarriage results, but no other damage ensues, the one responsible should be fined according to what the woman's husband imposes upon him, the payment to be based on reckoning. To summarize, the penalty for killing a person is death, but the penalty for causing a miscarriage is a fine. In other words, as horrible as the loss of a fetus may be, causing that loss is different from causing the death of a human being. In the eyes of this verse, a fetus is not a person. That doesn't mean that the author of this text thinks that causing a termination of pregnancy is permissible, but it does mean that the author believes it's not murder. And this perspective that full personhood begins at birth rather than at conception is a basic starting point for most conversations about reproduction in Judaism from the Talmud to the present day. It means that when a pregnant person's life may be in danger, most authorities would say they are not just permitted, but obligated to abort that fetus, a potential human being, in order to save the life of a human being who has been born. It means that many Jewish authorities will also consider the impact of a pregnancy on a person's mental health and even sometimes their quality of life as a legitimate reason to prevent or terminate a pregnancy. In Judaism, the discussion about reproductive rights is not about whether ever to allow termination of a pregnancy, but when and under what circumstances. By the way, the nuance in our tradition extends to the question of becoming present in the, pregnant in the first place as well. The Talmud has stories of women using contraceptives even without their husband's approval, in which the women are described quite sympathetically. In Tractate Yivamot 65b, a woman named Yehudit undergoes a traumatic birth of twins. The Talmud actually states that she went into labor two separate times, once for each of them. Uh, knowing that she doesn't want to go through this ever again, she disguises herself and asks her husband, Rabbi Chia, if she's permitted to take herbs that have the desired effect. And he says yes. She disguises herself because she knows he wants more children. And she wants to know his honest opinion about the law without his personal feelings coloring the answer. When he discovers what she has done, he's saddened. But the story leaves us with the impression that the choice she made was a valid one. Reproductive rights may have become a politically charged issue, but ultimately what we're talking about it's very personal. We're talking about decisions regarding physical health, mental health, quality of life, and the very creation of life. And in the Jewish tradition, there tends to be an understanding that one size did not fit all. 
While there is a robust debate about all sorts of issues related to reproductive health in the Jewish community, a common thread is that circumstances matter. Therefore, the idea of having a government place blanket restrictions on certain healthcare options threatens to restrict not just personal decisions, but also the ability of individuals to follow what they believe Jewish tradition recommends or even requires of them. The exodus from Egypt wasn't just an exodus from forced labor. It was an escape from a ruler who took decisions away from individuals and from a community, including reproductive decisions, and tried to make them himself. As we begin this holiday of freedom, let's remember those righteous midwives, Shifra and Pua, and what they stood for. The freedom of the Israelite women to decide for themselves whether to bring new life into the world. Let's work towards a world where we can each engage in the important questions about how best to care for ourselves and each other and how best to make decisions about our own and our family's futures. Let's do our part to make sure that each of us can continue to say with full kavana that early morning blessing. Baruch ata Adonai she'asani bat chovin. Thank you, God, for creating us free and that we remain free. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shkoach.